Ladies and gentlemen, may I now welcome you to the next panel under the title Attitudes, Aspirations and Crisis Resilience. Before we start, let me ask uh, those who will play an active role to switch on their video, which allows me to get a clear picture of who is here and who not, and would also create uh, an atmosphere of communality and joint debate. So my name is Jens Putman. I'm the head of the Department of Youth and Youth Help at the German Youth Institute. I may welcome you cordially uh, to this panel, Attitudes, Aspirations and Crisis Resilience. As partner of uh, the this year's uh, Demography Days, we were happy to become involved in the design and makeup of uh, this event. As to the title of the panel, we discussed it in the run-up, the COVID-19 pandemic, yes, does have a major impact on the life of the youth in Germany with a view at school, access to the labor market, lower mobility, lower rate of social contacts. We heard this at the same time, families were faced with huge challenges. For example, the restrictions on contacts, quarantine, and also the restrictions on extra scholastical activities. So it can be assumed that there was a growing isolation of the youth. Uh, the topic of loneliness uh, has uh, become uh, something that has gotten an increasing relevance. Uh, psychological disorders are rising in the youth and a central finding of the first round. We need to differentiate by situations in life, by social inequalities and all the other things. Uh, we have touched upon this already. We talked uh, generally about the importance of crisis and crisis experiences, uh, social crisis, uh, also attitudes, fears and expectations of the young. That was all before the attack of Russia on Ukraine, which is certainly also to be considered as an, another crisis. Um, growing up in a peaceful Europe uh, seems to lose or has already lost its factor as a natural quality. At the same time, we have not yet touched upon the climate and climate crisis as a crisis phenomenon. So there is a full agenda. I'm looking forward to our panel and I welcome for the keynote Jörg Tremmel. Jörg Tremmel works at Eberhard Karlsruhe University at Tübingen. He has an extraordinary professorship at the Institute for Political Science at the Faculty for Social Studies from 2002. 10 to 2016. He hold, held also a junior professorship for youth. He has got his habilitation thesis and he has the Vignal Agendi for uh, themes like uh, social justice, intergenerational justice and political theory. And also among those, his PhD uh, was written at the University of Stuttgart with a dissertation on the population policies in the context of uh, intergenerational justice and at the University of Düsseldorf on a theory of intergenerative, intergenerational justice. Uh, Mr. Tremel will start right away with his keynote and it will be commented by Doreen Siebernick. She comes from the German Education Trade Union, member of the managing board. Uh, Ms. Siebernick has been for years very successfully the uh, chairperson of uh, the Trade Union for Educational Professions in Berlin from 2010 to 2017. She's now member on, of the board and represents topics uh, youth and climate. Uh, she in, is involved with uh, European skilled workers. And I could uh, read, we have won someone who has a political compass and has also a strong willingness to shape uh, the political landscape and is uh, not mincing their words when it is about speaking out clearly and loudly. So after this keynote, there will be uh, the involvement of three PACE panelists, uh, 
Ms. Perkart from the initiative, Dominic Baer, who was also a member as the executive director of the initiative, and Karina Baksholiani, I hope I pronounce it correctly, from the European News Network. Please bear with me just to bear with me, please. I need to apologize. Please present yourself briefly whenever you take the floor. So now let's get started. And dear Mr. Tamil, I would first ask you to deliver your keynote, I think, and you have also brought uh, some slides. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Portman. I have prepared uh, the slides in English because I wasn't sure if there's translation. Um, so I think I, I, I will talk in English now and um, you can use a German translation if you need translation. And the setting is as follows. We have a pandemic that hits the elderly generation hardest. And we had a public answer to the pandemic that hit the youngest generation hardest. First of all, I don't want to talk down the effect of the pandemic. It had 18 million people um, who died and um, the specific jetzt höre ich die Übersetzung sehr stark im äh, muss mal gucken, wie ich das mache. Ich, mal kurz. ich glaube, jetzt hören Sie mich, aber ich höre die Übersetzung nicht mehr. And uh, one uh, specific feature of this pandemic was that it was especially dangerous for the older generation, while young people usually had only mild symptoms, mild symptoms. And at the same um, time, if you look at the disaggregated um, account of the state measures against the pandemic, these uh, government measures hit the youngest generation quite hard, sometimes much harder than other generations. These measures, not the uh, not the health effect, but the, the government effect had negative uh, impact on mental health, on education and employment, family relations and friendships, and also the trust of young people in democracy due to the limitation of individual freedoms. But um, I don't want to, um, to, to use now um, the, the government uh, policies as my main uh, target of critique, because make no mistake, we had a pandemic and Lockdowns were necessary. It was inevitable that some harm to the young generation was inflicted during the pandemic. But countries react differently, and that is, they made choices. For instance, here, um, there's a trade-off between avoiding COVID-related death and closing down public life, including schools and the economy. If you look at the triangles between, or if you look at the red one for Germany and um, the purple one for Sweden, you can see that Sweden uh, was willing to, yeah, to accept more uh, hospital hospitalizations and COVID death, and at the same time made less uh, public debt, for instance, and they didn't uh, shut down the schools and the economy to the same extent. So there are always choices, and it's a free decision um, of governments uh, what priorities uh, they have. A selected aspect uh, of the age group specific burdens uh, is a decision to close schools and kindergartens. Now, in order to contain the corona pandemic, the schools in Germany were repeatedly closed. Uh, there were no nationwide complete school closures in the spring of 2020 at the first wave of the pandemic and at the beginning of 2021 um, during the Delta variant wave, I think, when vaccines were already available. And there's now evidence that school closures in Germany had a number of negative consequences. For example, um, the learning time of school children has been drastically reduced during the school closures, despite efforts uh, of uh, homeschooling, of course. Um, and when less learning takes place, there are negative effects uh, in, the, in the CV, in the um, lifelong uh, career and income um, expectations that these people might have. And of course, these school closures also cause serious uh, psychological and mental health consequences. Um, visit to country home 
äh, Country School Homes, also Landschulheime, ähm, Schüleraustausche, Sport Excursions, which are normally highlights of a school's life, did not take place and uh, of course they couldn't uh, made up for later and children didn't learn, did not learn to swim at the same time when they used to learn swimming before. So these effects um, are just scars in, in the, yeah, the life uh, of, of young people and only a few cohorts. Now, if we look at it from an intragenerational lens, a social lens, then the school closures exhibited educational inequality because um, dispensing with face-to-face uh, -face instructions um, led to social dislocation. Studies show that computer games were booming in some families and television consumption increased sharply during homeschooling phases and especially um, this affected weaker children in families in which both parents had to work, for instance. According to the COPSI study, one in three children between the ages of seven and 17 suffered from psychological problems. Risk factors for this were um, low educational attainment and limited housing. Therefore, intergenerational factors, um, factors between generations overlap with intra, oh, there's a mistake. One, one of them must be intra and the other one inter, sorry. Um, so we have effects within a generation and we have um, effects between generations. Now, if we look at school closures in particular, um, there is a study um, which shows that uh, Germany was especially affected. Uh, only in Poland, um, if you look at neighboring countries, schools were closed longer. Um, but in Austria and the Netherlands, and especially in France, Spain and Sweden, as, as mentioned before, uh, schools were not closed so, so very long. So it's apparent that the German approach was particularly restrictive for children and adolescents. Um, Germany closed schools for a total of 183 days in the and periods of complete and, and if the periods of complete and partial closures are um, summed up. And um, in other countries, uh, like this chart has shown, um, it was uh, significantly lower, like in France, 56 days at much higher incidence rates and Spain as well. But school were just a higher priority for the government. One reason for the German approach, maybe this lead to a discussion later, is the lobbying of the um, German Educational Union, the GEW, Gewerkschaft für Erziehung und Wissenschaft, for longer school closures. For instance, when the union wanted in April 21 in Baden-Württemberg uh, the same day incidents for schools as for restaurants and cinemas, uh, that is, um, an incidence of 200, uh, whereas the government wanted uh, 160 cases um, in order to keep the schools more, more open. And I think uh, closed schools are far worse than closed uh, movie theaters. Schools are systematic relevant for, for the younger part of the society. Now, if the worst pandemic since decades hit the world, it is inevitable that young people suffer, as mentioned, as everybody will suffer somehow, be it physically, like the older generation, mentally or otherwise. After significant disruptions, schools and universities usually stayed open during the uh, later phases, the Omicron variant phase of the pandemic. Um, and we can now make a damage assessment and draw lessons for the future. And hopefully we don't have a discussion uh, about uh, new school closures in this autumn or winter anymore. Now, who is we? In a participatory approach, this we must include, of course, young people and youth organizations uh, themselves. What lessons uh, do they draw? Now, there's a new policy brief of the OECD, which presents uh, a non-representative sample of 151 youth organizations uh, from 72 countries on how young people have been experiencing the government action against the pandemic and what they propose um, as the way forward. Now, um, you can see in the chart that uh, we look only at the total uh, bars here, um, 
many youth organizations express significant concerns about the ongoing impacts uh, with regard to mental health. This is the highest bar with more than 70%. Uh, then education, more than 60%. Um, employment, um, family relations and uh, other things. Mm. When we look more specifically at uh, some areas, it was in fact, uh, especially the sports, culture and leisure sector, which um, impeded, um, or which, which was criticized most by these uh, youth organizations for the closure. That is, um, young people really suffered from not being able to do their football or basketball um, exercises in the clubs as before the pandemic. And they criticized this a lot. Um, and like I said, uh, something like um, Klassenfahrten and uh, those Abschlussbälle, uh, proms, those events which yeah, are not, uh, not able to, uh, to, 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 to do later were especially uh, in the focus of the critique. And then um, education came second, employment, health and uh, justice is, uh, is also mentioned. So these are the um, percentage figures where um, youth and yeah, youth organizations are very dissatisfied and dissatisfied. I think we can say that there's definitely a generation corona in the sense that two cohorts of pupils in, uh, in each uh, bracket of, of the education system have received less education. They have deficiencies um, during the, the, the school closures and um, they had less internationalization when it comes to older pupils and students, less sport opportunities, etc. But we don't know yet how deep these cars uh, will be, uh, or put differently, how resilient this generation turns out to be, because we need more time, of course, and more data to uh, make assessment of this. But we can take government action to let this, uh, to, to allow this generation catch up. Um, and of course, uh, governments are active. There have been programs in many countries, for instance, Rückenwind in Germany um, to address academic achievement lags, especially of people with vulnerable backgrounds. But I think a holistic approach uh, is still missing. That would be my um, last word. Uh, then what we need is really, um, more data collection about these scars, if I can use the term. This is how deep are the educational and other gaps. I've uh, experienced in the um, schools where my uh, children go to that the um, teachers were quite reluctant to really make an assessment how much of the um, Lernstoff of the um, education program was missed, in fact, and how much was uh, still um, taught uh, during online co online uh, courses. And also what we will know in the future, maybe in 10 years, if um, there has been a real increase in, in mental health problems. Of course, um, there are already some government uh, measures uh, going on in, in a lot of countries against these, uh, to, to fulfill those special needs. Um, so yeah, let's wait and see. But um, we will be, we will be, uh, we will know, know more in the future. And um, the the first um, picture looks, uh, yeah, not too completely bleak, but not completely positive as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much. Vielen Dank, Herr Tremmel. Ähm, für diese, ja, auf der einen Seite nochmal den Rückblick, auch in diese verschiedenen Phasen der Pandemie in den letzten zwei Jahren, auch nochmal für diese Bilanz über das, was wir sozusagen auch an Erkenntnissen äh, zu den Folgen, gerade auch für junge Menschen haben, ähm, was wir aber sozusagen auch noch nicht wissen und äh, vielen Dank auch nochmal für diesen, für diesen Ausblick. Ich würde jetzt gerne unmittelbar anschließen wollen mit unserem äh, Kommentar und dafür haben wir Frau Siebernick von der äh, GW so we will hear a comment now by Ms. Siebernick now of the German Education Union. Please, Ms. Siebernick, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Mr. Temmel, thank you very much for providing you this input, which I fully support. 
or at least support to a major extent. But I would now like to take the perspective of all employees, of teachers and of all education workers and experts in the last two years. And I would also like to look at the wider field of education because education starts from an early childhood age. So that this perspective of employees and of workers has been missing so for so long is even the more terrible because in the education system as a whole we had to observe a lack in experts and training numbers for young teachers are far too low well, lacking new teachers that we can recruit in many federal states just like in Saxony and in North Rhine-Westphalia we are seeing dramatic numbers. We know that by the end of this decade, by 2030, we will be missing and lacking up to 300,000 educators for our education system starting from kindergarten passing by school and also to school social work. We know that in the schools classes, numbers of pupils in a class have become too large. And the German education system is lagging far behind in all digitization processes. Mr. Tremel spoke of the systemic relevance of schools and he said how important it was for the younger generation. I would take a wider approach and say the systemic relevance of a functioning school and um, good quality in kindergartens has shown us that we need open facilities so that parents can work, can do their jobs. With systemic relevance, we are speaking about the point at which society can be maintained in a functional state so that mothers and fathers can still do their jobs that are relevant to the system. It has not always worked well in the last two years. So from the perspective of employees and workers, we need to state that the system is burnt out. Colleagues are highly exhausted after these two years. And we have no chance for the system to recover because the next crisis is already here. Namely, that we're seeing thousands and thousands of refugees coming in from, U from Ukraine. And again, the education system is called to, uh, to best perform, to take up children in schools, in kindergartens, young students from Ukraine in universities. So that also in the schools and in universities, we have the right offers for are refugees from Ukraine and um, health and safety at the workplace is also a topic that has fallen short in the last years and with the comments my union has launched in the last and published in the last two years we've referred to this we've asked time and again to look at health and safety at the workplace because you cannot work behind panels and barriers as you work with young kids and working with a face mask with young kids is quite a challenge, especially in primary school or in a kindergarten where it's all about giving kids their start into life with regard to their education. So from what we've learned during the pandemic in Germany, we know that this is not new. The German education system and child and youth aid organizations are chronically underfunded during the CDU government under Ms. Merkel in 2008. It was called out that 10% of GDP was supposed to be invested into education. We're very far behind having reached those numbers. We've seen this clearly because we have not been able to respond well to the crises that have happened. So wherever this has worked well and wherever children were receiving good care, 
wherever having been thrown back has shown us how important it was for teachers and educators to be there has made us thank all the colleagues who have helped us through the pandemics. It's been them who has uh, who have compensated for training offers missing, for the speed of implementation of aid going too slow. I hope that as a society we will learn lessons so that jointly we can master the challenge of focusing toward a better funding for education in this country, toward more training and professional and vocational education because what we've lost in the last two years we will need to pay for we will see a major impact of this so this is my comment i'm very much looking forward to the debate now thank you very much Ms. siebenik and thanks again for expanding this perspective of school education. Thanks for looking at preschool and primary school. Thanks for taking a look at education out of school, at uh, leisure time activities. And thanks for getting all educators' perspectives on board. I don't know whether you and Mr. Tremel will speak about the chart he showed, the slide he showed where he related the German Education Union to the European level. Let's see what happens in the debate. So now I would like to invite a further discussions. This is Anna Göppert of the Initiative Open Society. Then we have Dominic Baer. We had him here in the first panel. And Monika Akosoyani, she's a member of the Human Rights Education Youth Network. So I think everyone is here. And now I would like to invite you to um, respond to the keynote and to um, Ms. Zibernik's comment. Play, please give us your perspectives and add the information that we haven't heard about. Ask some more questions if you want to. And uh, you're welcome to underline some aspects in which your opinion might differ. There you go. You're welcome to use the chat or raise your hand using the raise hand icon. Mr. Beer, please take the floor. Thank you very much. I actually don't want to come to the political aspect of the debate between uh, GEW Union and Mr. Tremel's slide, but I would like to give you the local perspective, just like the municipalities participating on our program have told us during the pandemic, we um, started an intense debate between coordinators responsible for implementing our program. And we've also invited mayors to report back to us what their problems were or what issues they were facing. And they said that the perspective of children and young people were simply not sufficiently integrated into the into the measures taken so it is comprehensible that the youngest were most hit by these measures M many authorities and municipalities had ideas on how to respond and how to develop tailor-made solutions to that but they weren't able to offer everything they wanted to. For example, during the first very strict lockdown, there wasn't a possibility to offer any activities in open space. And we were hoping for a more flexible design of the rules in order to protect children's interests without compromising on health interests. And of course, um, protecting our health is most important, but we've also seen that at the municipalities, there was a very different way of dealing with it. So it's not just school, it's also administration and youth work. We're seeing this to be important. And we had many municipalities that weren't able to offer anything at all in their youth work and their structures collapsed. 
because this is also about education work and if educators cannot see the teenagers and people and the young kids they usually work with uh, for some time they need to restart the relationship with them and with their families but we've also seen some uh, municipalities who immediately switched to digital offers or who were able to offer some open space and open air activities so after most state measures were ended now after the pandemic they didn't have to start from scratch but they were able to follow up on what they'd done during the pandemic they even had got in touch to and with more young people than before through their digital offers unfortunately not everyone was able to do this but we can see how uh, committed some local authorities were, some municipalities were, and um, the setup was very different. There were different responsibilities and rules set by the federal states. So whenever the interest of children were involved, be it through children's and youth parliaments or through children's officers and commissioners, wherever these um, are established at all, children's and young people's interests were, were better integrated. And from that, we can understand that uh, the perspectives of those affected can successfully be implemented and considered. Thank you very much. This is the link with our first panel, I might say. Ms. Geppert, there you go. Thank you very much. I'm Hannah Geppert. I would like to follow up on what was just said about the link of these two topics with the buzzword of participation. And um, giving children and young people a stronger voice. Professor Tremel said it already, during the pandemic, young people were asked to show a lot of solidarity, but they did not receive a lot of solidarity. And this is something that children and young people reported back to us. There was a lot of talk about them, but not enough talk with them. So uh, we, at the in Open S Society Initiative, believe that those affected by a measure usually know best what to do in order to solve the situation so their voice must absolutely be heard and i would like to come to the things we know from political education and participation i'd like to tell you about our lessons learned in saxony we organized a citizens council on COVID 19 on the pandemic and its impact there were some young people who are still at school who attended this council which was good and then there was a project in which teenagers carried out a survey themselves asking other teenagers about what they felt and there were some requests and solution strategies that were developed on the grounds of that so of course there is an overlap with what mr tremel said i wouldn't want to repeat this in detail but there's one point i would like to add here which is the extreme stress and pressure young people are experiencing not just since the pandemic started but ever since social spaces collapsed this pressure became larger so there's this pressure of having to catch up with all the school subjects that um, they're lagging behind in now and then they're worried about the future they're worried about the present they're worried about their own future and they're also worried about our collective future they're worried about climate change and about climate injustice so of course we need to find a solution to that apart from the necessary political structures what we felt was that relief from pressure was important that crisis management is important to learn for young people this is what we hear time and time again learning about resilience at school taking the taboo out of the situation at school in class and not everyone has been encouraged to do this to talk about what the situation has actually meant for them and i would like to come back to the first panel now it's helpful 
to take young people on board as much as we can from an early point in time, if we can. And it's important to take the pressure off them. It's important to help them be more resilient, to help them get some relief from the stress and strain they're feeling. So these were some very important lessons we learned from our projects. Thank you very much. Ms. Gapad, I would like to come back to one aspect you just mentioned when you just said that we needed to train young people to manage a crisis. So my question is, what can the institutions do in order to get there? What can schools do so that young people can become more resilient, so that young people can come out of such a crisis stronger? What can local regions or what can municipalities do? What can the communities do? What lessons has research provided us with on how to make younger pe young people more resilient? How can we help them learn something from a situation of crisis? Any ideas? Do we need another subject in school? Ms. Siebernick? Well, I'll come back to what Ms. Gepper just said. She was talking about catching up um, the content of school subjects that's been missed and uh, we're seeing that there's a lot of money being invested now in order to help uh, students catch up with um, all the knowledge they haven't been able to to learn and to train supposedly we already said in the first year of the pandemic that the curricula had to be adapted and that pressure had to be taken out of the school system and that there should be less pressure with regard to exams. None of this has happened. And we can see that on the political side, additional funding is being provided only just now in hindsight. And we do criticize this. And just to respond to Mr. Bears and to Ms. Gepper's inputs or contributions, let me say, yes, it is true. Young people have not been heard enough in the last two years. And if we speak of democratic education or education for democracy and for participation, then we need time to do this. We need to wonder whether the schedule of a school week is really apt and suited to help young people learn how to participate in society and not just to be the spokesperson for their class who will attend a meeting once a month and once a year a school parliament will be held but a living democracy and living participation must be different and schools need time to do that if we um, imagine school along multidisciplinary teamwork, including educators, including social workers, including um, all day tuition, half of schools in Germany are primary schools and professions need time. They need time uh, to develop a joint vision and they need time to be in touch with children's needs and they need time to put this in practice and join projects. This is a giant task and I believe that school should cha change. I'm convinced that from 2026 there's going to be a change and in primary schools we will have full day tuition offers. So we should benefit from these opportunities so that schools can open up, schools can change. 
this may also be furthered by a multi-professional attitude, a multi-professional perspective on education and schooling. We can live and we will live a change. So holistic design of educational services would be a case in point. Mr. Tremel, would you please unmute yourself? Ms. Siebernick, I totally share your view when you talk about uh, the entire day schooling, uh, and I'm happy that there will be enough services offered from 2026. Uh, because I am a firm believer that to a certain degree you can make up for existing social inequalities through schooling. However, by large majority, we have half day schools and the pandemic, well, has brought forth uh, the best and the worst. In the, uh, I closely assisted a school, there were teachers who were deeply committed, they were very passionate during the first lockdown. They soon started to develop digital offers, or if the Ministry of Education was hesitant, they took the bold step forward and introduced the software so that uh, schooling could continue. But I do not know whether you know it, there were also teachers who didn't do anything. For example, they sent around one PDF sheet and told the children, well, there's enough work for two weeks. Uh, and when you asked, uh, what, did, what have they done? Well, they ha have uh, uh, redeveloped their wine cellar or they did some house repair work. For living off uh, the wages. So such a pandemic brings out the best and the worst in human beings. Uh, structural discrepancies uh, uh, emerge as well. Uh, the trade union represents just one side. Uh, not necessarily will they benefit the uh, students or pupils or athletics teachers. Uh, then there were some uh, teachers who prepared a YouTube list and for the next five days, uh, they didn't move and were not be heard of. Uh, despite receiving the full wage. I think we need to address these issues. Thank you very much. Let me see whether there is any reaction to this. Otherwise, I would like... Uh, no, uh, yes, you, Ms. Siebenig. Well, I do not want to, to deny what you have uh, said, uh, as in any other tr um, profession, we have uh, the overachievers that have a lot of uh, intrinsic motivation, but as in any other profession, we have supposedly the uh, one uh, group, uh, how can I get the best touch with the warm wall and where can I feel comfortable? Nonetheless, well, let me put it like this, at the moment, with uh, those uh, incoming Ukrainian kids. Uh, the Ukrainian educational system allows uh, students that are in the final year, of course, uh, online access. The U Ukrainian students that are preparing for the A-level, they can online pass the A-level exams. We are light years away from this, especially at the beginning of the pandemic, the colleagues uh, didn't even have an official email address or professional email ad address. They didn't have a proper workplace uh, with sufficient equipment with hardware. And the data protection guidelines are so exacerbatedly high that you cannot uh, use any offered learning software as a teacher. Quite often, you are not allowed to use such learning software. And these are the systemic necessities or the requirements. And we <laughs> have been living in a stone age, a digital stone age. And to reproach uh, the colleagues, why don't you work online, the, um, the fellow colleagues? Well, I think that's, that's unfair. I do not want to protect all my colleagues, but we are far away, a far cry from having good learning platforms. We are a far cry away from sufficient training and further training for teachers. Uh, 
even in the last two years, there were too few offers programs so that they could be qualified to cope with this situation. So to a certain degree, I need to protect uh, the profession of educators while still um, agreeing with you. Well, some people or some colleagues have developed, redeveloped their wine cellar, unfortunately. Yes, uh, probably last one thing. What I would wish to see is also an opening of the systems as in the past to the present day. We have a very closed educational system. We have the youth offices, uh, the interconnectedness with youth work and social work is not easy. It's not easy to cross open doors and to interconnect the various systems of social services and so on. So I very much hope that in as a whole day schooling is rolled out that uh, the action of youth uh, services, of the youth offices and departments is much more connected or will be much more connected. I hope that they will get some success. So thank you very much. I have a double challenge in front of me. I heard this on the one hand, uh, to a certain degree, the offers in the digital sphere, higher digitalization, not only as a hardware problem, but as a true challenge, an educational challenge, and at the same time also the other challenge, um, how to organize uh, and shape whole day educational offers. Mr. Bear, please. I would like uh, to take a step back uh, because we concentrate very much on the schooling, uh, but we have crisis resilience also as a general topic during Corona pandemic and during the intake of refugees. We had also crisis in towns uh, with a flooding catastrophe in North Rhine-Westphalia. Uh, and Rhineland Pallet in it last year. Not everywhere are we positioned in a situation of crisis resilience. Uh, so we should give some thought to this problem. How can we cope with the demographic challenges? And how can we always consider the demographic changes? Because this is not being done. The more we slide into crisis uh, situations, the less thought is given to the upcoming new crisis. The white, the elderly and the men are dominating the scene and the other perspectives are lost sight of. The topic of interconnectedness exchange, we see it again and again at a municipal level, but also at the higher levels, uh, we can see it. Too little communication between the various systems, perceiving the respect challenges and to fathom out the perspective for further development. The schools, municipalities and administration, wherever they are interconnected, things are getting ahead much better because uh, the services can be tailored to the effective needs of the schools, of the students. Mm, so even the administrative if uh, HR are more happy. Also, we have uh, quite often the same legislative uh, framework and also um, the curriculum uh, framework. There are huge differences between the various cities, but we also think um, in the background, uh, the Article 3 of the Children's Rights uh, Convention, the well-being of the child, uh, Article 3, the well-being of him, the best interest of the child must be prioritized among other aspects. I think this would also be an opportunity to involve this perspective, expanding the whole viewpoint, giving more opportunities uh, for experiences uh, rather than just looking at the whole problem from one's own perspective. Thank you very much. Uh, well, it sounds a bit heretic what I'm going to say now. A, isn't that built into the nature of any crisis? Isn't that the characteristic of crisis that you have to improvise to a certain degree? So can you really prepare for a crisis? 
that would be the first question. The, the second one, what uh, kept me in enormous suspension, uh, Corona, war, Ukraine, Russia, climate crisis. Are we really able to cope with more than one crisis at a time? My, my feeling is we can't just one, either war or Corona. Well, <laughs> to put it rather flippantly. Mr. Tamil. Well, in the Chinese, uh, you have a crisis. The word for crisis, uh, the sign for crisis is also the same as for opportunity. As a matter of fact, when it comes to digital infrastructure, we are better positioned than two years ago. So in that respect, uh, we can say, yes, we have taken up and uh, we have caught up. Um, I think the next time homes schooling will be better. It's not always only the responsibility of the service providers. It's also the responsibility of the teachers. Uh, there are different uh, types of teachers. Well, uh, whether it was worse in our country, I do not know. Germany has caught up at least. Uh, we are holding now a Zoom conference. Two years ago, I would have been obliged to travel to Berlin for just one hour of lecture, which would not have been good for the climate. So the whole society has learned a thing or two. Home office will stay with us. By the same token, sick children will benefit from remote learning or remote teaching. Tablet classes will be established to a high degree, which brings me to the aspect of the school once again. To give an answer to your question, well, crisis is characterized uh, by the simple fact that it cannot be predicted fully. Yet you can still learn from crisis if similar crises emerge. Uh, well, that war would break out and could never be expected, but you can do it better. Uh, well, the pandemic will come back with a, a variety of waves. Well, it's a, it will be a repeat, so we can prepare. Let me out myself as an explicit uh, football fan. The Bundesliga terminated, uh, has come to an end this season of football. No football team, either in the pro professional league or in leisure time, would ever start a football match without reserve. There are always reserve players uh, on the bench sitting. Unfortunately, we are pushed to the limit. We do not have reserve teams uh, prepared. We do not have those who can flip back and forth in primary schools and can... What, what we really need is a reserve bench, not only to be well positioned in crisis, but to be able to shape open educational work rather than uh, getting into the moves when push comes to shove. I cannot imagine what can happen as a wave of colds in October if we do not have any replacements and reserves uh, in the OECD ranking, this rich country of Germany, the educational system is not funded adequately. We need better funding. So then this or that crisis could be coped with much better. And I, I am a deep believer schools must become places of multi-professional teams. They must be interconnected to social spaces. Uh, and all this must be built into the educational portfolio of any teaching. I will benefit from anything that is offered by the social sphere. I can exit the school with my students. We all together should be able to do so. And if we were able to do so, we would be much more resilient. I'm, I'm deeply convinced of that. Well, let me ask you, do we have a fiscal problem? What is the cause of all? Do we rather have a problem of not having sufficient uh, concepts? Or is it a mixture of the two? Ms. Siebenig, listening to you, my feeling was, oh, if we had enough money, everything would be good. But 
at times, uh, probably we are lost with ideas. We haven't the clues. Well, let me take this up, if I may so. No, I don't think we have a lack of ideas. Not at all. There is no lack of ideas. For 15 years, there is a new study program, University of Early Childhood. Education in early childhood. This system has been in place for 15 years and it has never been able to train the educators as experts in the educational profession. In, uh, they haven't arrived at the kindergartens, uh, they have not really arrived and have not been integrated into the whole day schools, nor were they allowed to work in the admi public administration. 15 to 20,000 outstanding or brilliant people have been trained. Where are they? Where can they become active? There are so many good ideas. It's just one example of many. If universities uh, strive for excellency and then they neglect uh, the training of primary school teachers, if this is not part and parcel of this uh, label, excellent university. We have trained too few teachers, otherwise we would not be left with this gigantic mess. The federal lender have missed out on pushing upwards the funding for the tr academic training of primary school teachers, also for fiscal reasons. Uh, I think there is no lack of educational visions and concepts. I'm deeply convinced. It's a systemic uh, fault. Uh, we do not have enough money. All the numbers point to this. A school with only 100% staffing will be put to the wall with the first wave of cold. So we are short before half past two. So the thesis is here looming large. There is no lack of ideas. There is a lack of money. Any objection? We do not have to part ways in full agreement. Uh, well, the demography days are not meant to create a unisono agreement. Well, <laughs> let me look around. Yes, uh, sorry, the, I would love to see the first, uh, the third uh, teacher, the third teacher, the third educator is always the space. We have a bottleneck of repair work, of uh, restoration in schools and nursery schools. How long does it take to build a new school from scratch or the authorization procedures? the building permits and so on and so on before a new school is up and running. It's disproportionate. And the third educator is so important, space. It's so important. People, uh, children need uh, space, uh, thinking of whole day schools from eight to four in the afternoon. All the children squeeze into one room and the educational visions that the colleagues have cannot be implemented because there is not enough space. It is difficult. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the round. Well, I can take up some points. I have jotted down a few flashlights and I think it has been a good thing that we could also bridge the gap to the first panel on this topic of participation or neglected participation in the Corona times. I also take along as a, a lesson learned that uh, we are faced with several challenges on different levels, both uh, of a structural nature, just to thinking of digitization and whole day schools, um, Corona. We have uh, mixed feelings. We are looking forward uh, with mixed feelings. Um,
we still have a lot of good ideas and concepts, but we need to fund them sufficiently. Up to that point, once again, thank you very much, Mr. Tremel, Frau Siebeneck, uh, Frau Göppert, and Herr Bär.